Okay, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along here today to this um, final uh, webinar about inequalities and COVID. And we've actually got uh, a brilliant panel today uh, of experts, um, I should say, and I don't, I don't use that word very very lightly because they are experts in, in what they do and in their in their field of knowledge. Um, so today's uh, discussion is about uh, COVID inequalities and ethnic minorities. Uh, and when normally we think about ethnic minorities, we think about migrants and maybe people that come to our country. But um, here in Ireland, we have our own ethnic minorities, which we have sort of discriminated against for, for years in terms of not accepting maybe their culture and um, and how we put barriers in place. We were just discussing even barriers to, to education there. So firstly, we're going to have um, our head of school, uh, Professor Chris Laslett, speak very briefly um, uh, just about what's what's going on. Um, and then I'm going to um, call upon Kamini Rao, who's the uh, manager of the Stravan Ethnic Community Association. Um, after Kamini, I'm going to hand over to Thomas McCann, who's uh, an Irish traveller and a long time uh, Irish traveller activist in terms of rights and equality. Um, then we have Kevin Lunny and Natasha Palmer from Bernardo's, who are going to talk about unaccompanied minors. And finally, um, we have Anne Freel from um, the Donegal Travellers Project, who is um, the primary healthcare coordinator within Donegal. Um, and they're going to, um, and she's going to particularly speak about the inequalities uh, faced by the traveller community. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, our school's own um, I suppose um, ethnic minor minority person, which is all the way from Australia, uh, the amazing Chris Laslett. Thank you very much, Sean, and, and welcome everyone just on behalf of the university. It's great to see you here. We've got the numbers creeping up already up to 126. Um, and that just shows why absolute enthusiasm and excitement this series has created and why the appetite there is amongst the professional communities for more chances to discuss social justice uh, in a lot of different guises. So fantastic series and congratulations to the organizers. I think this is the last one today for this series and it's been a, a brilliant set of um, events. Uh, so congratulations to the entire social work team uh, and, and everyone else they've worked with to get this series um, done and, and, and everyone who's participated and all the speakers, it's just been brilliant. And, and a really important topic to finish on today, you know, is looking at, uh, in the introduction to last, the last uh, seminar on, on gender, you know, a point I made in the introduction was that COVID-19 is not the great equalizer is the great unequalizer because it takes structural forms of violence and exacerbates them even further and nothing could be more true for ethnic minorities both here in Northern Ireland and and then down south and beyond you know it, it doesn't need me to, to introduce the fact that we've seen ethnic minorities assailed fiercely and vehemently over the past decade in particular, as the global financial crisis has set its, its um, effects across the world. And we've seen populist politicians uh, employ the dog whistle again and again to target um, minority groups uh, a, a, a in order to justify um, quite authoritarian um, governmental policies and approaches. We've seen um, ethnic minorities being targeted uh, in quite violent manners, the, the almost unheard of or, or certainly underreported genocide of the Rohingya in, 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 in uh, Myanmar is one example. We've got the Uyghur in China um, at the moment, and I'm sure that barely touches the surface of the sort of injustices we're seeing today. We also know that ethnic minorities are ones who are more likely to be affected by COVID, are more likely to be in the front line, who are more likely to be precarious financially and, and, and in these situations. So for all those reasons, this is such an important topic. And, and, and Sean was very uh, 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 forthright in saying we have very, very much more knowledgeable and important speakers than me. So I agree entirely. He has my full support in that. And I shall now hand over um, to so what will be to Kamini and other speakers. I'm sure it's going to be really fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, our first speaker is Kamini Rao, and she's the managing, uh, been managing the Straban Ethnic Community Association for the last five years. So, Kamini, over to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Sean. Um, yeah, my name's Kamini. <laughs> <Not Kamini. laughs> There's my first mistake. <laughs> yeah, my name is Kamini Rao, and um, I'm the project coordinator um, for Shivan Ethnic Community Association. Um, um, the association was founded in 2004 um, by my dad, Bobby Rao, and the reasoning for him founding this association is through racial hatred that he experienced himself. Um, the aim of our association is to identify and respond to the needs of ethnic minorities living here locally and to raise awareness and understanding within our local community. So we would work a lot with the local schools, we go into local community groups and we go into workplaces and things as well. Um, we represent 250 families um, in the Strabane district area and we provide the services that um, are needs that for the BAME community that are living here. By us providing these services, it just makes it easier for them to transition into Northern Irish society because it can be a very difficult task, especially coming to a country where you've never been before, you don't know anybody, so we'll be here like first hand. We work very hands on with the family. Um, some of the services that we provide to the BME community is um, our and the local community as well is our multicultural and social events and activities. Um, now before that we were chatting. Um, just about um, how we should be getting into the curricular activity. Now, us as a group, um, we work locally with six schools. Um, the projects that we do have been put into their local curriculum um, with the local schools. So we tend to work from them from a very young age, um, which is brilliant. Um, unfortunately, but due to COVID, we have had to find all our alternatives to do that. Um, usually we're more interactive where we've been in the schools working for nearly eight weeks, but unfortunately we haven't been able to do that. We also do cultural raising awareness workshops and diversity training, um, hate crime awareness, um, community development. So we'll do interview skills with our members um, and how to fill out job applications and things like that. Um, we do training opportunities, so child protection, food hygiene, mental first aid and basic first aid, just basically trying to build up their CVs and things like that. Um, English classes is very important and also we provide Polish classes for the baby young Polish community here. Um, we also do a lot of citizen and passport and visa work. Um, I myself have been trained by the Home Office um, in doing EU settlement schemes. So I've worked with nearly 200 families so far uh, with the closing date coming now to December 2020. Um, so I've got a few more families to work on, but hopefully we'll get to the end of that. And um, we do health awareness workshops as well. And we also started up a youth group, which we've been working with. So we do summer and winter programs. Basically, if an ethnic minority family moves into Scraban, we're usually the first point of contact. Um, and we're providing all these projects. Now, bear in mind with COVID, um, it has been very difficult um, to do any of these projects. We've had to, to, to go look at how to do it digital, like via Zoom and things like that. But, Sometimes it's a bit difficult with the language barrier um, and we have to provide translators and things like that, but I will be talking about that um, further on. Now, I was asked here um, to talk about um, how COVID has affected locally um, the ethnic minorities living in Strabane and my experiences with locally with the social workers here. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, during COVID, the community groups in Strabane came together to form a community response team and it was called Strabane Town Against COVID-19. Um, from March to July, the team helped with local people and also ethnic minorities that were vulnerable and were unable to leave their home. Um, some of the services that we provided were pharmacy collection, um, drop off uh, meals and wheels. So they received two days a meal, or two, two meals per day for three pounds. Um, there was a food bank, a listening ear service, hotel transportation for cancer patients, and there was also an essential shop and delivery. I myself um, answered the phones along with all our volunteers, where some of our SECA volunteers worked in the food bank, which at that time was heavily relied on within the local community and ethnic minorities. Um, I'd just like to emphasize that this, all this work was done by community workers and volunteers. We had no help from the local authorities. Um, we did receive some money from the Department for Communities, but that was it. They just left us here our own devices. So locally, um, on the 19th of March, 
uh, is when it sort of started to get busy for myself in terms of the ethnic minorities being affected by COVID. Um, uh, O'Neill Sportswear, um, which has employed, they employ many um, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, closed down on the 19th of March. Um, I came into my work on the 20th of March and there was already people queued outside our centre um, looking for help because they, they just lost their job. I knew it was going to be busy that day, but I, I didn't expect to be as busy as what I was. It was a, a very stressful day in terms of trying to help people. Um, so what I had tried to do was like get people started with JSA and Universal Credit. Um, I worked with 13 people that day and I just had to, at five o'clock, I just had to literally just close the doors and ask people to come back on the Monday. Um, it was very, very stressful because every situation was different. Um, everybody that came in, their worries were different. Um, I know it was the same for most local people that had lost their jobs. They were like, what am I going to do? How am I supposed to survive? Like I have a family to feed. But then in terms of people that are not from here, they're thinking, am I going to be deported? Are they going to send me home? Who's going to help me? What about my children? We've built the life here. Like that was also going through their head as well. So that night then when I got home, I was like thinking like, how am I going to help this family? It's just me on my own. What am I going to do? And luckily furlough, um, the furlough scheme had came so that like took a lot off my mind and it took a lot off their mind as well. As we went further um, into the lockdown, I had to close our centre. Um, our centre is right in the heart of Strahan. Um, It's accessible for everyone. Um, we have a youth wing up the stairs, there's computers and things, so it's, it's always busy. Um, so I had to close it, but myself, I was busier more than ever. Um, some of the people that I was working with, most of them had lost their jobs. Um, or they had just been let go because there was no work. But these people, these ethnic minorities were people that were getting cash in hand. So they were working at um, car washes or in shops or they had like, you know, small cleaning jobs. So they literally, their income had completely stopped. And a lot of these uh, people that lost their jobs had quite large families. Um, this is when like I myself had to rely, start to rely and get a close relationship with the local food bank here in Strabane, in Newton Sturt and in Cassadere, um, that, so that I'm thankful that they were there to help us. Um, some of the people were unable to register for benefits for ethnic minorities to receive universal credit. It's very, very difficult to get them. Um, reasons this is that they don't have enough evidence for living in Northern Ireland. Um, maybe they haven't, they haven't paid enough tax, which is all fair enough. Um, but they were all being, most of them were all being turned down. Um, one of the guys got turned down because they said his English wasn't good enough. Now, this is the first time that I have ever, ever heard this before. I was shocked. Like, they say that, and when I went, when I went and spoke to them, then I said, you turned him down because of his English. And they said, yes, you need to get him English classes. And I was all, but that's very difficult. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you need to give us some leeway here. But I'm Fortunately, we, we did, we were able to get them sorted, but it did take a while for it to come through. So we were still relying heavily, heavily on food banks, but we did, we did get them sorted at the, towards the end. At the minute, NI Direct has stopped giving out national insurance number. Um, you're able to go ahead and work, um, but national insurance numbers are just a no-go. Um, I'd be talking to NI Direct every week, I'm like, why, why is there still no way we can get national insurance numbers? And this is during the pandemic, it's just not feasible to give them out. That, that's their answer and that's it. Um, you will, you can go ahead and work, but you will be put on emergency tax. Now, for people that are born in Northern Ireland, when we are registered at birth, we receive, we get our national insurance number straight away. People that are here or that are moving here, they, they have to apply for a national insurance number. Um, I have a local boy um, who has just came back from Australia um, with his girlfriend who is Italian. Um, they came back when the border started to close. Um, so they've been here from about May. She was lucky enough to um, find a job in Lidl. Um, she's been working every hour that she has been given, 30 to 40 hours a week. Um, but because she still hasn't received a national insurance number, she's on emergency tax. 
and she is only getting half her wages. So when she should be getting about nine hundred pounds, she's literally getting about four hundred pounds. Now this is very very worrying because still to this day, and I direct cannot give me even a time as to when national insurance numbers will be given out. Um, so if you have a national insurance number, is when you're allowed to open up a bank account. So she can't open up a bank account. To register with the doctors here locally, you need to have a bank statement. Um, she's still unable to get registered with the doctors because she has no bank statement, because she's unable to open a bank account because she has a national insurance number. So it's just, this seems to be like quite a knock-on effect now for the ethnic minorities as, as to the, like the knock-off of COVID that is happening. I was saying earlier on that um, the work that I do is very interactive. Um, when I'm working with all my members, like I bring them into the center, I sit down, we have a cup of tea, I talk to them. No, I can't do that. Um, everything has to be done via Zoom um, or on telephone. And there's just in some cases where I just can't do that. So I have to bring them into the office. Um, there's plastic sheets up over my office and they have to wear a mask. Even still, it's very, very difficult um, with the language barrier as well. Um, the work that I've been doing is just starting to get harder. I've had to cancel English classes, which last for 12 weeks um, because we went into a local lockdown ourselves and now we're, we're into a national lockdown. Um, all my citizenship work and settlement scheme work and visa work, again, all had to do via phone. Um, with that as well comes a lot of paperwork um, that I usually like. I like the... I like the clients to be there when I'm working with them. Again, I can't do any of that. So my experiences with working with uh, social workers locally, and I hate to say that, is I have, in the six years I've been working here, five years, I have never had any experience with a social worker that was based in Shaban. I did have a telephone call with one recently, but it was a brief telephone call. Um, the guy that rang me, um, I was working with a family and they were getting their EU settlement scheme. They've been here for 11 years. Um, it came back that the mother did not have um, enough evidence uh, to say that she's been living here in Shaban. So what I have done is um, I wrote to the local doctors and I asked, she's been registered with the doctor. I know she has been registered with the doctor for quite some time. Is there any way that I can get a doctor's letter just to say she's been registered? Now, most of the children have been born here, so their English is like spot on. One of the daughters, she's over 18. She took the letter down and she was there with the mother and they were translating. And I got a call from the social worker to say, well, we can't, we can't give it there because it's not a proper, she's not a proper translator. And I was like, well, come on, you have to give me a bit of leeway here. It's hard to get translators now, like they won't come out and meet you. And he was like, no, we have, this is the only way, but I just gave up completely then when I came to a social worker and I just tried to get it, uh, I just tried, I just did it on myself and find an alternative, that's, that's what I have to do. I've worked with social workers that are based in Derry and they call on behalf of ethnic minorities that are living in Derry and I help them as much as I can, but because I'm based in Strabane, the services that are in Derry might not be the same that is here. I do know that social workers work with ethnic minority families in Strabane, but They've never came in contact with me. So in some of the situations that I've dealt with, I felt that they could have been, there could have been a more positive outcome if I had a working relationship with the local social working team. Um, I work very closely with the neighborhood uh, policing team. We make contact every other Thursday. Um, if there's a new member of the team, I get to meet them. Basically what they're ringing me about, if there's been a hate crime or a racist incident, they'll ring me straight away, which isn't that often. Uh, thankfully, but uh, they still keep in contact with me. Um, as I mentioned before, I've taken over this role from my dad. So last night, like we were just talking about this and I was like, I can't wait to hear what everybody else's experiences have been with social workers living locally. And and I says to him, so what's your experience being with social workers? And he says, none. He's all, I don't think they like us. And I was like, what do you mean us? And he says, social work or ethnic minorities. And I was like, what do you mean? He says, I think they look down at us. He says, this is why I just worked on my own and tried my best for all the families. And when I heard that, I thought like, that's not good enough. Um, that's not right. 
I do feel that there is a need for social work professionals to get into the community and to become more involved, especially now more than ever, and especially like by ethnic minorities because they aren't integrating as much because we've had to stop so many of our projects. Um, that's when uh, ethnic minorities and local people um, interacted with each other and now that's all, that's all had to stop. Um, but in terms of social workers, I hope that I can start to form a professional relationship with them and I hope that it becomes a good outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And some very sort of important points there. And I suppose the thing is about ethnic minorities, they're very, uh, when you move here, your mental health can deteriorate. There's some brilliant pieces of research out there uh, in Northern Ireland about people's mental health deteriorating when they migrate. Um, so I'm going to go on now to our next uh, speaker, um, Thomas McCann. So Thomas is a member of the Irish Travelling Community and a long-time traveller activist. So he was a founder member of the Irish Traveller Movement, um, he was employed as an equality uh, worker, and is, is a, the director of that organisation, among other things. So um, thanks very much. Um, and we'll all switch off for our cameras, our panellists here, and, and let Thomas come on. Okay? Yeah, it says... Um... Um, uh, Sean, that, that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Right. Um, so I'm wondering. I, I won't be, unless that's changed, I won't be able to kind of share. Right. Well, we'll change that right away. Okay. Emma, are you, are you able to change uh, uh, Thomas's rights so that he can? Uh, it's funny you're on talking about rights, Thomas, and your rights have been revoked within the last five minutes. <laughs> oh, well, you know, all the excuses for unintentional kind of, uh, but it's unintentional. Let me see. Um, um, but anyway, thanks very much for having me. And I'm just, while you're trying to do that, I'm, I'm replacing, actually, I'm here instead of uh, a traveller who's a social worker. Uh, who was meant to be on. So I'm kind of um, stepping in on, uh, instead of them, and I'm delighted to be here to do that. Um, and again, maybe you'll, you'll let me know when, when you have that done, because, um, and I can just talk away until we get there. Um, the, um, you know, we've found it very difficult, the Traveller Council Service, in terms of uh, particularly during the COVID. I mean, it's hard enough to reach travellers, um, you know, and um, get, uh, 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 engage, uh, get travellers to engage with the Travel Council Service without having... So the that should be it, Thomas. Okay, having the COVID-19 situation. And um, now we can find this. Uh, let me see. Okay. Okay, here we are. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we, we have put the, um, um, the council in online and by, um, and by phone. And I think most travellers actually at the minute, we'll do a review of it at some stage. Uh, but I think most travellers uh, um, uh, prefer the phone, believe it or not, because you don't need internet for the phone and it's easier for older people to, to manage. So just to say that, um, you know, just to say I'm, as was introduced earlier on, I, I, I'm a traveller myself and I um, set up the Traveller Council Service, which is a specific uh, service for travellers. Um, and um, uh, I've also been involved in travellers' rights for a very long time, um, so so I have. I'll just try to get this up. I'll just go through it because it was. I don't know what how much people know about travellers and where people are joining from. So my assumption is that pe that some people might know a lot and some people might know very little. Um, roughly, there's about forty thousand travellers in Ireland. It could be a lot more. I mean, counts has been political things in the past in terms of uh, local authorities and and that, but. Um, and it's only in recent times that the census has included traveller questions. So, uh, so, um, so it could be a lot more, about 40,000, uh, roughly about 40,000. A very high percentage of travellers are under the age of 25, you know, with low life expectancy. And I'll kind of just touch on it there. That's, you can see why that is. It's a very young community. A third of tra travellers are thereabouts. Now that changes, living in the greater Dublin area. Life expectancy, as I said, you know, kind of, it's nearly the reverse. If you had a permanent situation in terms of the settled community, you have the reverse in the travel community. Uh, much, um, uh, a lot less older travelers. Um, um, life expectancy for men is 15 years less. That was, you know, kind of, 
and that used to be kind of uh, life expectancy was longer in the past. In the 1980s, there was a study done and traveler men used to live um, um, only uh, kind of, I think it was 10 years less in the 1980s, now it's 15 years less. Um, um, women is 12 years less. Infant mortality rates three times higher. That hasn't changed since the 1980s. I mean, it was Dr. Joe Barry, if people want to check this out, there was research done in the 1980s. Dr. Joe Barry, um, the, the, hasn't changed. In fact, you could say things has got worse health-wise uh, for travelers since that study was done in the 1980s. Um, so a lot of health difficulties for travelers. Now I'm only touching on points here. Uh, travel culture is nomadic, has always been nomadic, really. Um, uh, uh, it was only since the 1960s with the itinerancy uh, report, 1963 itinerancy report, that uh, a process of assimilation was um, instigated by the Irish government in the, in the, in the South. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that has had terrible consequences. Uh, um, extended family, um, mainly travelers live in extended families, although that's much more difficult now uh, for many reasons, and we might touch on that. Uh, self-employed, uh, travelers have been traditionally self-employed, uh, so they have, um, you know, a, a number of different uh, things, recycling, tinsmithing, um, uh, farm labor, and, uh, you know, markets, horses, um, you know, but self-employed usually, you know, um, uh, yeah, language, um, shell to gammon or cant, which is called, um, uh, is, is, is spoken by travelers. Again, you know, it's in, it's a it's huge decline. I mean, like many languages, like many minority languages does not resourced and, you know, and particularly where it's, um, um, you know, where culture isn't, uh, hasn't been supported. Um, and likewise, travel language, although we're looking at trying to revive that and trying to, uh, and there's huge interest in that. And there's a couple of people who's doing that at the minute. Um, oral traditions, music, singing, storytelling, passing on of history orally. A traveler, and earlier on, I was talking, when I was talking to Kristen, like, you know, traveler history is an oral history. You know, it's not a written history. Uh, so, um, so there's differences there in terms of, you know, how history was passed on. So travelers kind of have been written out of history, really, um, sort of have, and, and where they are mentioned, it's usually not very favorable. So, you know, so very little kind of um, in terms of the history of travelers, and there needs to be more research done on that. We have some travelers who has uh, studied, uh, studied um, history and who's historians now, but and hopefully we'll look at that at some stage. Um, Cures, uh, you know, uh, healing people. I mean, I say healing people, I mean, a belief in healers. You know, Travers, a lot of Travers has a strong belief in healers, so that, you know, people who heal. Uh, religion, strong religion, still a strong, um, um, very Catholic kind of, um, the, the, not all Travers, but the majority of Travers would be uh, Catholic, you know. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, gatherings would be around illnesses, death, marriages, Christmas, family occasions, you know, kind of. And maybe um, markets and stuff like that, but it would, uh, you know, kind of it would be around them occasions that family would, would gather. Uh, you know, some of the issues that travelers face is poor accommodation. You know, uh, certainly down in the south, um, you know, um, local authorities resisting um, providing travel accommodation and not using the uh, money that has been provided by central government. Um, you might have read about some of that recent, in recent times. Very poor health uh, for many travelers. Um, uh, exclusion from goods and services, um, educationally disadvantaged, as I said, less than 1% get to university. Uh, so, do a high drop, uh, particularly from secondary school, and there's many reasons for that. Um, uh, discrimination and racism, for example, in employment, there's 84% unemployment among travelers. Uh, very hard to get employed, or even when people are employed, um, you know, they're let go, if it's found out that they're a traveler, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, family is being forced to live in in overcrowded and um, uh, very poor conditions. And I mean, this has implications now in COVID-19, if you're talking about hygiene, if you're talking about self-isolation, if you're talking about, you know, it's very difficult for many families in, in, in these conditions. It's difficult generally, but in these conditions it's even worse. Uh, restrictive laws, uh, like the trespass legislation, anti-trespass legislation, which makes it a crime actually uh, in, the, in, in Southern Ireland, in the, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to travel, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if there's a complaint made against you within, 24, within 48 hours, if you haven't moved, uh, your caravan is confiscated 
and impounded and you have to pay to get it out. And I, we've dealt with families who, whose caravans have been impounded. It has only ever been used against travellers. So, you know, it's, it's, this is not a law that's kind of, uh, that's for everybody, as it was uh, said in the beginning when it was brought in. This is a law that has been used against travellers uh, only. Um, a Control of Horses Act, you know, which made it more difficult for travellers to keep horses. Uh, which has been a tr very traditional for many travellers and still is much more difficult uh, to keep horses and to, um, uh, the markets, uh, license in the markets, uh, a lot of travellers used to use markets because they recycle and the, you know go out through the houses and stuff like that and kind of um, uh, and then sell what they got out, out through the houses in the markets um, you know that's very difficult because you had to get a license and some of the conditions for the licenses and the same with the horses was you know uh, it was very difficult to get. Um, mental health, uh, suicide is seven times higher among travellers than in the majority population. Uh, high rates of depression, higher numbers of travellers in psychiatric units in comparison to the, to the majority population. Uh, drugs, drugs issues is kind of an upward um, uh, trajectory uh, and continues that way uh, uh, with, with drug use, um, um, both prescription and illegal drugs, uh, and particularly uh, class A drugs uh, such as heroin, cocaine, um, you know, uh, and that has, has a devastating effect. And just to say in this as well, and, and it's not in there as well, I think at the last figures that, was, that, that I've seen was around 12% now of homeless population in Southern Ireland are travellers, which is really high. We didn't have that before. I mean, that's, you know, um, um, and also then travellers are in crisis by the time they reach the, uh, the mental health services. And that's coming from within the mental health services themselves. Uh, the, the barriers, uh, there's no ethnic identifier in, 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 in the services. So travellers are invisible a lot of the time uh, in services, including the mental health services. Uh, lack of acknowledgement and respect for travellers. There was a recent survey carried out in 2017 um, by the Community uh, Foundation Ireland. People can have a look at that as well if they want uh, a lot of very interesting information that that was the most recent survey that was carried out, national survey with travellers uh, on a national basis. Uh, um, in fact, services can, uh, can, uh, can view traveller culture as deviant and, you know, and as, as the problem, as seen as the problem. And, you know, they see their role as kind of helping travellers to move away from this. And I think social workers, uh, it was mentioned earlier on, you know, now there's, there's good and bad in every profession and, you know, but certainly um, uh, in terms of uh, a lot of children being taken into care, uh, social workers would have had, had a key role in, in this, uh, uh, in, in, in travel children being taken into care. And some of them certainly would have, you know, uh, come from this kind of uh, framework, come from an assimilationist framework. Um, <coughs> uh, models and frameworks that, uh, that are, are used are ethnocentric, then they're based on, on the needs and uh, values and, and norms of the settled community and expectations, and they don't fit, you know, uh, and they can exclude uh, uh, people, you know, can exclude a lot of minorities, including travelers. So how do we begin to change this? Uh, one is, I think, developing an awareness that, look, we, you know, kind of, that people, you know, are uh, excluded, Sometimes, as I was joking earlier on, sometimes unintentionally and sometimes intentionally because of the cultural background that they come from. And I think we need to, we need to look and we need to become aware that that is the case in Ireland today and that has happened. Uh, you know, and we need to, and we need, then it's identifying the steps that we need to take to change this. Uh, so we do. And I'm flying through this and I mean, I just, you know, um, you know, part of this can be part of our change in this ourselves as, you know, practitioners. Um, uh, you know, is being aware and sensitive to our own cultural heritage and, you know, and how that shapes who we are, our values, norms, traditions, you know, because we're all cultural beings and we're shaped by our cultural, uh, by the culture that we grow up in, every one of us, you know, I, I, me by, by the traveller culture and so other people by settled culture and, you know, so, and, you know, and that has kind of values and norms and, you know, and it influences how we engage with, with others from other cultural backgrounds, you know. I think valuing and respect and diversity, I think is a key uh, value that we need to kind of develop, you know, um, and you, 
if we're, if we're going to be inclusive, it kind of, I think really that's, you know, if we don't have that, I think, you know, I don't think it's, it's, it's going to go, get very far. Um, understanding how comfortable we are with difference, you know, and being aware of stereotypes and biases of travelers that, that, that one carries, uh, uh, being aware of emotional reactions, um, you know, kind of to people, because that has implications for how you work with people, how you engage with people, how you kind of, you know, whether people feel welcomed or not, you know, uh, having an understanding and knowledge of the, the cultural groups we're working with, family systems, community hierarchies, taboos, you know, them is really important things that we don't uh, step on somebody's kind of, you know, uh, kind of uh, ideals or values, you know, that we kind of, that we're aware of, of them boundaries, you know, um, developing uh, an understanding of how racism and discrimination and oppression operates and how it has impacted on a particular group we're working with, you know, and I, I think people will be able to, you know, kind of that, that having, having an understanding of that and kind of, uh, you know, going out and looking at that. I think there's a known as them, <coughs> excuse me, on people who's working in, in services to, to understand that and to understand that, that impact because it does have an impact on people's lives and how they see the world and their trust and a whole range of different things. Um, um, and also their access to, you know, goods and services. Um, understanding the socio-political uh, uh, influences and how these have impacted on individuals and groups that we're working with um, and the barriers that, that, that groups face. I think the historical um, uh, and contemporary relationships between the majority community and travelers is, is, is important to understand as well. That, you know, them relationships, like, I mean, and again, it's, it's, it's kind of looking at some of the, you know, uh, the research can help us with this in terms of looking at the relationships that's there. Um, because, you know, the settled community, uh, like certainly in, in Southern Ireland, and I'm sure it's a bit similar in, in Northern Ireland at the minute, uh, you know, kind of uh, the majority, there's a, there's a cohort of, of settled people that doesn't want to include travellers, that doesn't want travellers, you know, and uh, wants to exclude travellers. So I think it's important that we understand this as well, um, that we develop a broad range of helping styles, you know, that we you know, that, that we're able to kind of change how we're doing things. And, um, and you know, I'm also a psychotherapist for the people who don't know that and, 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 and a supervisor. And so it's looking at what, you know, interventions that, that can help people and uh, interventions that kind of, you know, so you, we can change the things that we're, you know, and reflect on them. Um, uh, to be interested in the community that we're working with. I mean, you know, kind of, and outside of, outside of the work I mean you know and like for example I mean there's a lot there's a lot certainly there's a lot of stuff that that uh, that happens outside of the uh, the work that people do in terms of and travel pride is only one of them travel pride week there's a lot of other events and I'm sure with other ethnic minorities as well you know that we need to kind of um, uh, develop an interest in in the community that we're working with and, and to be able to develop an empathy with people, you know, I think that's really important. I think in terms of the models, we need to, and ethnocentric models means models based on the majority for people who don't really understand what ethnocentric means. It just means models that's based on, you know, on, on the needs and on the values of, of the majority community as opposed to the, the minority community. Uh, we need to evaluate and challenge the models of, of counseling. I just say counseling and psychotherapy, but also other professions as well. We need to look at them models uh, that have been developed, mainly, you know, kind of, and I mean, I'm generalizing here, but mainly by middle class uh, settled uh, white, white men, you know, in, in, in general. And also, it, you know, usually there, there are models that was developed kind of, you know, in the 18th and 19th century, like, you know, so we need to look at, you know, uh, these models. And we need to examine the expectations and assumptions and values that underpins them and the approaches and modify and change them if necessary so that they don't, they're not, they're not exclusionary, that they, we can, we, we don't have to try out the whole thing, but I think that we need to be able to look at them and see, are, is, is there, are, they, are they stopping people from uh, coming in? I'll give examples of that, but I mean, I don't have the, the time. Uh, these models, you know, and frameworks, um, Use, a, use particular frameworks to understand client problem, client's problems. And we need to examine these frameworks to ensure that they're 
culturally inclusive. Um, I just wanted to in, in, uh, kind of, and uh, you know, there's so many areas. I mean, you know, hopefully maybe another seminar down the road and, you know, open it up a bit more. But um, uh, we need to differentiate, or I'd like to differentiate between, you know, a service being co becoming culturally inclusive and individuals who are who develop, you know, culturally cultural competence and culturally inclusive interventions. There's two different. Um, if it's a service, it needs to have one is, and I put it in there, is an ethnic identifier. So as you know, the service needs to know how many, how many, you know, how they're getting to the community, how to plan their uh, their service, you know, how to, because it's very difficult. One is very difficult to, um, uh, to protect the rights of people who's invisible in your system, in your service. Uh, but the second thing is it's impossible to plan for a people who's invisible. Uh, so this, and you don't know how your service is responding to that need. So an ethnic identifier is one. Um, but there also needs to be policy uh, if it's a service, because, you know, even where you have an individual who's kind of really kind of culturally competent, and who's really good at what to do, if that's not supported by, by the service and there's not a policy in place in that, then they're left on their own. They're kind of left on their own to do that. And I think, so I think we need to differentiate, you know, uh, between, you know, uh, developing cultural competency as an individual and what I need to do. And when we're looking at an organization or a service or indeed a university, uh, as we were talking about earlier on, um, and finally, um, you know, travelers need to be employed in the service and not only recipients. Mm -hmm. Now, I think in, in the original, I, I didn't have only in there, but uh, not only recipients of the service, because travelers need to see themselves reflected in the services. And a lot of the time, they don't. Now, I mean, there's a whole, anyway, look, I just touched on that, and hopefully that gives some uh, food for thought. And again, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So thanks very much. Thomas, thank you very much. And I suppose there's some very sort of important points there just around ethno, uh, ethnocentricity and understanding um, cultural differences and that understanding of cultural competence. So, um, and I think we can learn a lot from the, the traveling community, especially have, as we have increased um, migrant numbers coming into Northern Ireland since the ascension, eight, eight, eight countries in 2004, and with a glowing, uh, global refugee crisis, which sort of leads me on now to Kevin Looney and Natasha Palmer from Bernardo's, who are going to speak about unaccompanied minors and the work they do um, with unaccompanied minors and in Northern Ireland. So if the rest of us panellists can maybe switch off our microphones and our, our, our videos and, and we'll hand over to uh, Kevin and Natasha. Hi, um, I'm ho hopefully going to share my screen here, so um, let me know if this works okay. Um, and I hope everyone can hear us okay. Um, yeah, everybody can hear you and see you. That's yeah. brilliant. Thank you. Okay, I don't know. So, um, yes, uh, my name's Kevin. Um, Hi, I'm Natasha. And uh, we work with the Supported Accommodation Service for Unaccompanied Young People in Bernardo's. We're a service that was set up during the pandemic due to a pressing need um, in our trust for there to be more residential accommodation and support for unaccompanied young people. Um, Natasha and I both worked for the NI Refugee Support Service uh, prior to that, working with Syrian families who had been granted refuge in Northern Ireland uh, through the uh, Vulnerable Person Relocation Scheme, which is a resettlement scheme. Um, those schemes have been halted at the minute due to the pandemic, so uh, but we'll talk a bit about that later. But we'll go ahead and get into this. Um, we've got quite a lot of definitions that should be coming up here on the screen, um, and I guess just to focus on that is to emphasise that not everyone who comes to Northern Ireland from another country is kind of categorised in the same way. Um, I don't really have time to go through them all now, but I guess um, the important thing to look at there is in terms of refugee, it's someone who is fleeing because of a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality. Um, and I think that can often get lost in kind of the conversations around refugees and asylum seekers a lot of the time. And um, for the purpose of the kind of this presentation and the work that we do now, the definition at the bottom of an unaccompanied asylum seeking child um, is just helpful to have a read at. It's someone under the 
the age of 18 years um, who is applying for asylum without a legal guardian um, in their country of origin. So um, this is a graphic uh, by the UN and they complete this infographic every year. And it's a great tool um, to just look at the people that are displaced worldwide. As you can see, there's 79.5 million people forcibly displaced in the world at the end of 2019. That's our most up-to-date um, statistic. Uh, that's 1% of the world's population. And if I can just draw your attention to the fact that 40% of those displaced people are children. The top countries that these um, people come from are Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South, South Sudan and Myanmar. Um, and I know with each of those countries, we know that uh, we can start to think of the reasons why that will be. Um, and that's, those top countries have changed uh, since last year. And um, I don't have time to go through all this, but it's a great um, infographic to use if you are interested in this. Um, we've, there's some statistics here that we've put up um, just around kind of the numbers of un unaccompanied asylum seeking children that are arriving in the UK and I think it's always easy to look at the statistic and be like wow that's a big number but that's nearly 3,000 young people and children that we've got who are arriving into the UK from last year and um, who are arriving after horrific experiences of grief, loss, trauma and maybe started their journey with family but have ended um, by themselves and um, I think it should just kind of hit home that that's a lot of young people um, who social services have an obligation to um, support and act in their best interest. Um, there, there was a decrease and that is potentially because of the, the COVID pandemic in terms of the safe legal um, routes such as the VPRS scheme and the EU settlement scheme having been halted because of the pandemic and like I'm sure we've all seen in recent weeks the kind of channel crossings and the devastating impact and loss of human life that that um, causes. So COVID has had a direct impact in terms of that, in terms of safe ways to access um, the UK to claim asylum. And then also just a middle point there, just in terms of the actual asylum process when they're arriving as well, interviews being halted and the stress of that process being dragged out to an even longer extent than it usually would be. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, direct impact that COVID has had in terms of the journey, in terms of their experiences before arriving in the UK and also when they do arrive in the UK or Ireland. Um, so at the minute, uh, UK um, border policies restrict safe and legal routes. Um, and I suppose I'm talking about uh, things like the Syrian Vulnerable Person Relocation Scheme that me and Natasha did work on. Um, the, there is a huge impact um, on, on, on those routes and therefore that creates more of a reliance on people making dangerous journeys across the channel, particularly from the north of France. Um, and I suppose our asylum process in the UK and the government's hostile environment um, are designed to deter people, but really that whole system comes at a huge financial, moral and human cost. Um, violence, detentions and deportations are used to scare people off the UK. This happens in Northern Ireland, there's people being detained and deported from the North of Ireland at the minute and um, these deportations have continued through, throughout the pandemic. Um, the UK government's been criticised for that but they've continued to do that and I think we see in the news at the minute um, with the Home Secretary discussing I'm thinking, considering ways which they are going to make it more difficult to cross the channel, um, even using a machine that's going to make waves that are going to uh, make the journey untenable. Um, and I suppose um, when we think about our definition of social work, um, we can see, we think about social justice, human rights, collective responsibility, respect for diversities, empowerment and liberation of people. I suppose, uh, thinking about that, um, I think the social work needs to be a very clear voice in advocacy um, for uh, refugees, migrants and asylum seekers, um, very clear in challenging the hostile environment and for challenging the oppression that um, these groups face. And just quickly, this is, I suppose, a photo of a camp in Calais, and I just wanted to 
show a photo to make it clear of what some of these camps look like. Um, the, the camps have worsened greatly since the COVID-19 outbreak. Limited access to clean water, shelter, or appropriate sanitation. But it's a, a bad time at the minute because as winter approaches, it becomes much more dangerous and deadly for the people living there. Um, I guess when we think about unaccompanied, unaccompanied young people and what they've been through in terms of their journey of having to leave their home country, their culture, their family, and um, like that in itself is such a grief and a loss for them um, even before they start the journey and there's so many um, horrific experiences that young people have gone through in terms of their journey and what they've experienced throughout that, whether that's trafficking or traveling alone or losing family members along the way. Um, so inevitably this has a huge um, direct impact on, on these young people's mental health and I think um, as social workers and professionals involved in the lives of unaccompanied minors we really need to remember that and I think um, that's always there and then added with the stress and anxiety that a COVID-19 pandemic um, adds to that is just huge and when we think about what maybe the coping strategies that young people would use to kind of combat some of their um, mental health struggles normally in terms of getting out um, and socialising, meeting in groups with other young people, um, kind of moving forward with their asylum process, all of those things have been impacted um, by COVID-19 and um, when they're taken away, it kind of exacerbates a lot of the stress and um, feelings of isolation and anxiety that unaccompanied minors have. So I think um, it's so essential that people um, and professionals who are in contact with unaccompanied minors like have that in, their, in the forefront of their mind all the time, especially this year more than ever. And then I suppose to talk just a little bit more about mental health risk factors. Um, we often talk about pre-migration, peri-migration and post-migration as sort of stages of the journey and stages where a lot of, there's a lot of mental health risk factors. You can see throughout um, the three of those categories, there's exposure to violence, there's dealing with family loss, separation, death, sexual violence. Um, you can see in pre-migration, unsafe living conditions, war, persecution, abuse, but really post-migration also um, challenges navigating systems of care, but also those unsafe living conditions again. Um, for some migrants, um, abuse, hate crime, um, having to get used to processes of working with the home office, applying for asylum, being scared, that uncertainty. Um, and th that's all magnified at the minute because of what is happening. The, um, the young people who are going through these systems at the Home Office and have just been told that you're, there's no substantive interviews to process their claim, um, that those things have came to a halt. The stress that comes along with that is enormous. Um, and there is, of course, as we know, a huge problem with discrimination, hate crime and uh, stigma in our country. And um, it, it seems at the minute that that is getting worse. Um, a, a huge problem post-migration, of course, too, is language barrier and financial hardship as well. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that there's, a, there's more I could go into there, but I'll move on. But. Um, I guess just in terms of practice with individuals or professionals here working with unaccompanied minors, and I always think that we really have to take the lead with the young people here because they're they're coming, and we need to understand how unaccompanied minors are viewing us as well as professionals who are figures in authority who are often um, kind of representing systems and charities that mean nothing to the young people to start. So I think taking it at the young person's pace is one of the most important things for um, making sure that you're understanding that young person um, and kind of expecting that it's really unlikely that they're going to trust you straight away and we can't expect that. We can't expect or demand like instant trust. That's not um, what a lot of the young people's experience has been from authority figures. So I think understanding that and not rushing in with kind of your own tokenistic agenda or like your own deadlines or your own paperwork um, yeah, you just kind of have to set that aside sometimes and work at the pace of the young people. Um, yeah, and often, like it says here, the amount of stress, trauma, grief, loss, cases that these young people have experienced means that they will and potentially need to see someone who's skilled in trauma-based therapies, but as well, um, alongside of that, 
is again taking it at the young person's pace because the idea of opening up of talking is scary and it's easy for us to go to a young person's like oh it's what's best for you but we, we have to take that at their pace or else it could do um, more harm than good um, and I think yeah just that point there about new generalizations as well like we can't look at unaccompanied minors as a whole as a group and think that okay we'll treat them all the same that's not the case there's so many different cultures so many variations of cultures and um, personalities no two children are the same so we should never assume that about two children who are no two children from Northern Ireland are the same so it's not going to be the same from elsewhere in the world either. Then moving on to education I suppose uh, education is often one of the main reasons cited for making a journey and that stands for um, refugee families and, ref and uh, asylum seeking young people unaccompanied young people um, education is usually a safe and important place in terms of integration as well for the young people that we work with schools and colleges are in a good position to support with mental health needs and to facilitate a broader feeling of acceptance um, at the minute difficulties with school closures mean that learning in learning english building friendships and general integration sort of comes to a bit of a halt um, and just to highlight as well for young people that we're working with remote learning is particularly difficult and um, you think of all the difficulties we're all having um, with zoom with online remote working um, when English is not your first language, it can be extremely difficult to understand what's happening and to get used to those systems. We find that remote learning has meant that the young people here are really, really struggling um, with a lot of their schoolwork. Um, I guess this slide is a little bit about how, you know, working with refugees and asylum seekers should be really rooted in kind of your value base as well. And especially if you're a practitioner, a social worker, or somebody who's working with refugees, asylum seekers, unaccompanied minors, or any minority ethnic group. And um, it's kind of not just our job to work well with the young people, but to challenge and um, like broadly and um, practice or comments like with ourselves and our own mindsets and with others, because um, it is so much of a broader picture of um, sometimes how we view people who aren't from our own country and we need to kind of constantly be challenging ourselves and making sure that like for unaccompanied minors they're a child in need they're entitled to everything that a child from Northern Ireland is if, if they're in the care system and um, I guess like it's continuous advocacy and um, because a lot of the time young people don't feel confident to do that themselves they don't um, feel like they're in a position where they can ask for more of us because sometimes they feel indebted which um, so it's kind of us um, and other professionals encouraging them to speak for themselves or if not us um, advocating on their behalf and I think um, it can be controversial and uncomfortable sometimes but you really do just for the sake of the young people and kind of have to keep that advocacy going. Um, and thinking about culturally competent practice as social workers um, cultural competence comes from social action, social justice, advocacy and anti-oppressive practice. Um, it is vital to account for specific and unique cultural needs of our service users and I mean, I want to emphasize it's vital to do that and it takes time and energy to do that as a professional. Um, we need to be self-aware about our personal values, be willing to challenge these. Um, we need to be mindful of the language we are using and to definitely avoid a taking a blanket approach or making assumptions about service users that we're working for. Um, we must be flexible when using our existing frameworks and tools and resist tokenism in doing that. But we're not ticking a box that we have considered cultural needs or whatever. Um, we need to, it's practical and it um, has to be a tangible thing that the service user experiences. Um, we need to get to know the service users and take the time to do that. Um, sorry, I know we're nearly out of time. And um, just this last hour, yeah. Yeah. Do we have? Do we still have a few minutes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, this yeah, this slide just around ethnically sensitive social work practice, um, and it is just emphasising that it's like an issue of power and powerlessness, and these young people um, do not have a voice and are so often silenced um, in kind of social work practice in 
community in the media um, and like our role really is um, to continue challenging that and to can um, especially in the pandemic where often asylum seekers or refugees are kind of pointed at towards escape as scapegoats and um, it's just really important that we don't stay silent in that and um, continue to kind of ensure that they get what they're entitled to and what their rights are. Um. And just uh, working with interpreters, I'm not even going to go through this slide, but just to say you must use an interpreter when someone needs one. And that means that when most social work conversations, you're talking about things that are very delicate, things that are require the person to understand you completely. You must use an interpreter, whether you um, whether it causes extra work or whether it causes a cost for your service. It's something that has to be done by social work. We've experienced recently that the pandemic is sort of being used as an excuse by a lot of health professionals and social care professionals to not use interpreters. Um, yeah, this is our last slide and I guess it's just a summary of everything that we've said just in terms of the number of refugees and asylum seekers is increasing and is going to continue to increase and Northern Ireland is becoming more and more diverse and that's exciting and like we have such an opportunity as professionals to learn of these cultures and um, to take um, our lead from them and what they have to teach us so I think we have to remain resistant to like um, any form of communication that says otherwise and continue to challenge our own mindsets and, and look forward and keep um, kind of championing the rights of those who are silenced, which is often the case in the refugee community. Yeah, brilliant. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And just to sort of mention, uh, we've got the Twitter hashtag, um, which is hashtag social work, social justice. And uh, I'm going to, there were some sort of very pertinent points that the, the previous speaker, Thomas, had mentioned as well. Um, I'm going to pass you on now to Anne Freel, um, and Anne Freel is uh, a member of the traveling community. She's a traveler woman. She's a human rights activist and works as a primary health care coordinator um, within the Donegal Travelers Project. So uh, I'm going to introduce, uh, pass these over to, to Anne now, um, and she's our, our last speaker. So thank you very much for coming along, Anne. No problem, Sean. Thanks very much. I think yeah. Kate's going to put my slides here. She's there, she's also a problem technique. Uh -huh. Kate, if you, you share your camera, Kate. I'm having trouble here trying to share. Sorry, I'm trying to. Uh, uh, and if you just. Turn on your video, Kate. There yeah, you that's go. It. And then if you share your screen. Oh, the joys of technology. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Don't worry about it. Um, sorry, I just I don't know why it's not working, unfortunately. Um, Is there a green button at the bottom of your screen, Kate, that says share screen? Um, it is. It's just not coming up on the screen for some reason. Um, sorry, folks. You're okay. No, right. Have you the PowerPoint open in the background, Kate? I do. Oh, here it is. Hang on. Sorry. Sorry, folks. <laughs> there you are. That's it. firing up now. Uh, text text a wee minute they start sharing. Modern technology. And I suppose this is what uh, there you go. okay. There you go. So that's you, Anne. Thanks very much. And uh, um, so John said, I am Anne Freel. I am a member of the travel community and I work in Donegal Travel Project here in Donegal. Um, today I'm going to talk about COVID-19 and there's travel community. Now I was going to briefly talk about the study and research. I know Thomas has touched on this, so I'm not going to repeat and um, save time. Um, so go ahead, Kit. Go, go ahead, Kit. Next slide. Back, back in the second. So I do work at Donegal Travels Project um, and Donegal Travels Project is a vibrant community development 
organization to the travel community in Donegal. Um, we're an NGO. We have been established since 1986. We're a partnership of both travelers and members of the majority population. And we represent the traveler and Roma issues at a local, national, and international level. And we are committed to principles of community development um, and they underpin our work. We also uh, work with the Roma community and BME communities. And we have seen a rise in the Roma community in the last number of years in Donegal. And it's represented by over 60 families in the county. Oh, there must be a technical issue with uh, Kate oh, sharing the screen. Technical issue there. Uh huh. And I suppose, um, and when Kate's trying to get that sorted, so it's been established since 1996. The the, the travel, and is that the same across all counties, or is Donegal unique? No, there's a number of organisations, as Tom, Tom as well knows, across the whole county of uh, Ireland. Um, Pally Point, probably one of the first travel organisations um, uh, to be established. Um, but we are around 1986. We are an independent organisation, but we are a funded body as well. And um, we have right. a number of different funders, such as uh, Social Inclusion, HSE, Department of Justice, and TUSLA. And is that funding recurrent, or do you have to go... Um, every year and look for that funding? We apply for funding every year, every year, right. every year, but the same bodies that fund every year. Um, so we are, so we the work that you do, you can't, you can't guarantee because you don't, are you, are you not guaranteed the funding? No, we're not guaranteed the funding, but we do get funded every year, we can wait lucky. We have, that is, we have a big organisation, Donegal Travels Project is a big organisation, we have a number of different initiatives. We have the Primary Healthcare Project, which I coordinate, um, and that is made up with 10 members of the travel community working on the ground in the area of health. Now, people's hours ran from seven hours to 20 hours to 30 hours. We also have a preschool that has been established for the last 40 years. It was a travel specific preschool, but in the last 15 years, it has changed to an interculturalist in place preschool. And that's the way we went for that. And we have, I think it's about 20 different children from different ethnic minority groups attend that preschool. Um, we do have an education program that we're very lucky to get funded for um, through this pandemic that supports children and, and young people in the education and the parents. And we're very lucky to have that in this current climate. And we yeah. do have the Roma project as well that's funded through the Department of Justice. And we do have a big population of Roma in this county, over um, 60 families. And in the travel community, we have over 360 families in the county. And we do have links into cross borders as well because we've got a families coming and come going. From cross borders, well, so we are in every county of Straban and Derry. Yeah, and you see, so your work specifically employed as a as a health worker, and is that physical health or emotional health, or mental health? We work from the social determinants of health, and um, underpinned by community development. So we look at you know health, we're looking at accommodation, we look at education, and um, access into services. It's all through the social determinants of health model, um, that we would be responsible for. But in the last um, number of months, you know, the pandemic, because we are a community development organization, um, this pandemic has kind of started firework us, you know, around meeting the needs and interests of the travel community, but around COVID. We do, we've done a, a number of different um, measures for the travel community to meet the needs and interests. You know, we do have phone services now that we contact the travel community on a daily basis. And we're lucky that we had a good relationship with the travel community and we have a great database because we are a community development organization in the past before COVID, it was neighborhood work it was out in the ground working with the travel community the travel community can then use our services on a daily basis but now a lot of us done through you know technology but all the frontline services are still being delivered and um, phone services would consist of you know getting the, the, the conversation around the guidelines, if any of those issues coming up for families, if families had to be tested, supporting families to work that, contacting public health, you know, working and engaging with them as well to ensure that. And also we found in the last number of months, especially with COVID, you know, a lot of different services cropped up. 
a lot of um, different um, interagency groups set up and Travers had a place around that table, you know, for a community response team was set up here in Donegal where you'd have the local authority, you would have the Red Cross, you'd have the community organisations. Travers had to look for a seat on that board, you know, and then with different services come up around meals or, you know, different agencies. They weren't being reached out to travel community only for the work of the travel organization, engaging with the travel community to interact with them services, travelers would have been forgot about. Definitely. Yeah. So and when you discuss, you mentioned their um, social um, environment. If I can come in. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the things I was just wondering is about when you mentioned social determinants of, of health or ill health, and is that mainly around housing and mental health and mm. maybe poverty and things like that? Well, the Dollar and Travel and Health study that um, Tom has touched on, you know, that gives a drive and that gives a platform to where, where we move forward um, in the area of health. And you know, we're talking about accommodation, you're talking about education, you're talking about um, mental health. We know the suicide rates are seven times higher in the travel community, as Tom has touched on as well. Um, yeah. So that kind of gave us a foundation of where we should go as a travel organisation, travel private healthcare projects, what would be our priorities and around that. And from HSE, from point of view where I'm funded through, they look at key form indicators, which is mental health, diabetes and um, um, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular. Now, as a community development organisation, that can be a bit challenging because we're not the medical, we're the community development piece of it. So that can be challenging. But Kate's got one of my slides up. And we know from the All Ireland Travel Health Study, I know Tom's talked about the population of Ireland, but we know that there's over three, nearly 4,000 travellers in Northern Ireland. Now, when the study took place um, back in 2008 and published in 2010, you know, it showed, you know, the same infrastructures weren't in Northern Ireland as was in the public. So I believe in the neighbouring county, you know, working with travellers in the county here across, across the border, border, that them numbers are probably not a realistic figure of travellers in Northern Ireland because of the infrastructure just wasn't there at the time the study took place. And I think there was gaps. And I know Kate had, uh, Thomas touched on attitude of travellers. This was the research, you know, conducted with the Community Foundation of Ireland, looking at attitude of travellers. Travellers were part of the research and so was the members of the settled community. And the statistics are quite shocking. And you see why travellers emerging out very badly across um, the social determinants. So in 2017, only 26% of travellers considered life in general to be better for the travel community in the last five or 10 years. 82% of travellers have been affected by suicide. 77% of travellers have experienced discrimination in the last year and 43% accessing services. So when people think, oh, you can, the services are all there, they're accessible for all, but that, is, that might be the reason. But people find them difficult and people feel that they've been discriminated against when they do access them services, members of the travel community. The majority of travellers feel that they are not respected in Ireland and all their culture. 90% of the community agree that mental health is an issue. And Thomas talked about statistics there about mental health, and they are quite shocking. And I do believe if it was any other community, the suicide rates were seven times higher than the national college um, by government. Um, accommodation applied to the mental health has perceived to be the um, have declined over the last uh, past years. And this is what the, some came up with self community's responses. 70% of self community surveyed and would not have a traveler as a neighbor. 83% said they would not employ travelers. So when you think about high rates of unemployment within the travel community, you know, you're looking at 83% said they wouldn't employ a traveler. And very often travelers wouldn't identify as travelers if they're looking for employment. But if you put in a CV and it's based on your second name or your address, you come from a hot and state, you're not even get shortlisted regardless of your qualifications. 91% um, said they would not have a travel family member. Um, 83 said they would not have a friend who is a member of the travel community. And 50% said they would not have travelers part of the community. And 75% they would not work with the traveler. So if you look at the unemployment statistics, high levels of unemployment, you know, and that is the attitude to settle people and employers, you see why that would be a high factor as well. But I know I discussed it briefly before kicking back with the PowerPoint. Um, Around the COVID pandemic, you know, the COVID pandemic has affected daily lives of everyone and it has been a real challenge, but it has been a particular challenge to travellers and ethnic minority groups. The outbreak often describes of this virus treating everyone the same. 
and we look if you look closer at it, it does not discriminate based on gender, based on ethnicity, based on disability or religion. But it, there has been a particular challenge to the travel community. And over the past number of months, I was said around different forms, and you know, you have Sarah say, Oh, and you know, we're all in this together. But the reality fact, we're not because the pandemic has further highlighted an increased level of inequalities in the travel community, including limited access to water, electricity, and sanitation. You know, a lot of people think for privilege of closing the front door and want to want to wash their hands, but members, some members of the travel community hasn't had access to hot water to wash their hands, electricity, or toilets. Go ahead, kid. Um, Travellers are named as a risk group when it came to COVID-19 by government, but this didn't happen by accident. This happened by local and national organisations along with social inclusion advocating on behalf of travellers to be not nominated as a risk group when it came to COVID. And it was based on low life expectancy, high infant mortality rates, high rates of, of suicide, poor housing accommodation, and high levels of racing experience, and unemployment, education disadvantage and poverty. And they took them into consideration when they were looking at travel to be part of the risk group. So when I talked about earlier, um, some of the responses, like the phone calls and, you know, meeting and leading and interest of the travel community, it was done in a different way, but we were still there. There's some workers still out in the ground doing front line. Um, and normally that would be even advocating and lobbying. You know, you'd found the side of the road with maybe a 14 foot touring car with three children, no electricity, no toilets, uh, no access to water. We advocated um, with the Donegal County Council um, to get some of them services. Some were placed, but it's still a going battle. We also looked at, you know, there was materials out there and they were for COVID-19, but we felt that they weren't reaching the travel community. And we know from the Northern Travel Health Study that 50% of travellers still have problems with literacy. Um, and also they weren't very travel culture appropriate. So we use different tools to get the message out about, you know, school attendance, about the virus, the signs and symptoms. We use videos, we use Facebook, and we develop materials. But these materials weren't just developed for the travel community, then they were adapted to work with the Roma community and other ethnic minority groups. Um, for, the, for example, asylum seekers that we have a project as well, and they were adapted to the languages and all. And it is a good way because not all materials to meet the needs of communities. We adapted our own. So when we look at culture competency, I know that everybody took up at the culture competency and look, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's important that agencies and organizations work together to be inclusive of the travel community. A good starting point would be look at your own culture competencies, your organization culture competencies, and it's important to think about inclusion and what it really means and how to be inclusive of the travel community. And don't use this as an add-on or an afterthought. Think about it before, before as, a, as an opportunity to be inclusive. Because very often, you know, we're, we're always left to the end as an afterthought. Oh, we can include travel as a tick box here. Or, um, or we better add the travel community to this. So to embrace and to be inclusive from the start and look at culture competency. So let's just be excellent. I'm sure some other people have seen it. You know, in order to treat people equally, we have to recognize difference and take positive action. And it's like the gentleman asking everybody for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam. Please claim that tree. You know, very often people often say, Oh, aren't you, our service doesn't treat any different. We treat everybody the same, but by treating everybody the same, you create inequalities. And the word difference, some people, you know, are afraid of the word different. But there's nothing wrong with differences in my eyes. And I feel embrace difference, you know, and you treat, you have to treat, you have, people are different and to respect differences, you know, to be to, for equal outcome. And that is it. And I apologize for the mix up on the PowerPoint. So I hope I got captured most of that. Thank um, you. And that, I think that was absolutely fantastic. And sometimes mm -hmm. we can bring people on to speak that might have read a bit about it, but when we have the likes of you working on the ground, you give us the clear facts, the clear understanding as part of that community. And I, I wanna thank all our speakers here today, um, and you yourself, and Thomas, and Kevin, and Natasha, and uh, Kamini. 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 
I was, I was going through my list. I was scrolling up on my other laptop. But I think um, we as social workers um, need to understand the impact of um, how ethnic minorities are discriminated against and how this can compound people's physical and mental health. And during this pandemic, how it has, it has increased significantly and how, and as I think one of the points that Anne made is that we're all in this together, but she says we're not because it's nearly like an afterthought. And, and I suppose um, there is no borders um, when, when you look at, at Northern Ireland um, because people travel across the border every day. So the likes of, of Anne, she's probably working with people and she's based in Letterkenny or something like that there. She's probably working Lufford, Straban, Derry, Letterkenny. And people you know, have families across all parts of Northern Ireland. There's some people on here from Newry. And I know there's a big traveling community around the Newry area and Dutch. Dundalk and Drahada. So that's the kind of things that we need to be understanding. But more and more so, and um, the impact of being trafficked under the country that Kevin has mentioned. So there's some very key pertinent points, but we've went way over time today. And I think um, that's testament to some of the, the presentations here that they, they could have probably spoke for hours mm -hmm. in terms of it. So a lot of the stuff here is very pertinent and we need to try and understand better and, and not just have it as a tick box exercise. So, Sean, yep, go ahead. Sean, Kevin, or Sean, sorry to cut across you, but I know Thomas just wants to come in there, if you don't mind, please. Yes, Thomas. I think, I think you know, just uh, as an observation and kind of from my own experience, a lot of the issues that uh, kind of asylum seekers, refugees face and travelers face are cross cutting issues with travel yeah. issues. You know, and I think, like, if you look at racism, you know, uh, or you look at exclusion, uh, or you, and you look at the need for cultural competency and services. I mean, as was talked about by many other people, I think a lot of them are very similar similar issues. And we need to kind of, but one of the key things I would say is that was that what was said earlier on is that social work, I think, needs to kind of um, uh, kind of reclaim maybe some of its identity and kind of become yeah. a clear voice yeah. as an advocacy for 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 oppressed and excluded groups. I think that's really. It needs to yeah. reclaim that identity because I think in the last number of decades that that identity shifted across to be uh, to be agents of the of the, of the state in some ways. Yeah. You no, know, and that's kind of you mm. know they're not all social workers, but no. generally were used as housing yes. agents as others, you know, yeah. and welfare agents. And I think that 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 identity needs to be reclaimed. If I was a social work profession, I think yeah. that's. And I think that's a very good point, Thomas. That one of the things that social work has become has become a, a tool in that sort of ne neoliberalist approach, yeah. where you're counting, we are just a bean counter in terms of bureaucracy, and we forget about the person. But I think even from a personal point of view, as, as a social worker, you need to sort of look at that. The basics that a lot of social workers learn in the first term of social work training is about uh, Thompson's PCS model and how you, as a person, discriminate against people with the language that you use. And then we have to understand how on a cultural level and then on a structural level, how people are discriminated against. I do think that's a good, very good model, Sean, for people mm -hmm. to kind of get a grasp of, you know, yep. it kind of yep. gives a, a bit of a framework for people to work with. Yep. Yeah, but definitely. I so, and I am aware there, there was oh. over 170 participants on, and the numbers has gone down now because I know that people are, are on this during their lunchtime. But one of the important things is this was the last in the webinar series. There's another three before that are up on the NISC website. If you go on to NISC.info, you'll get it. Um, and there is a hashtag, hashtag social work, social justice, and we're trying to keep it going on. But uh, hopefully, this has grown legs now. and. Um, if we can try and continue with these uh, further, hopefully this will be a catalyst for something going on. Mm. Uh, Sean, I just want to make one point, and it's just to respond to something that Anne said, and it's really, really important, you know, for the Indigenous and the Traveller movement in the North. The point that Anne makes about there being the structures and the infrastructure are really, really poor in the North. You know, and it's almost gone full circle because 20 years ago, there was a lot of fantastic work going on with the tra mm. um, with traveling, the traveling community in the North. I myself worked at um, the Belfast Travelers Education and Development Group. And I think we've a lot to learn, Anne and Thomas, you know, and even just talking to colleagues across the border. And I think that that is a challenge, you know, to um, our, our colleagues at departmental level as well about the need to re-engage mm. and, and, to, and, to, and to learn and to work on that cross-border all Ireland basis. 
um, to try and, and promote that. There, you know, I think over, over over the years there was a strong there was strong groups. Yeah. There, on Manitoba and others, and I think you know there are some people in in the north who's trying to yeah. develop them structures. And I think yeah. Be supported. Yeah. I think the community yeah. needs to yeah. be supported to do that because if that's yeah. supported there, it's very very difficult. You know. So yeah. I think, and I think with the onset of Brexit, a lot of that European funding for helping our ethnic minorities is going to dwindle, it, dwindle away. So yeah. on that note, everybody, thank you very much for engaging today. Thanks for all the questions and all the comments. And as I say, all this information and the presentations are going to be available on the NISC website because all the panellists have finally have kindly contributed not only their time and effort, but they're going to share it with us going forward. So thanks very much, everyone, and keep engaged, and hashtag social work, social justice. Listen, thanks very much. All thanks, Thomas, thanks, Thomas and Kate, family, everyone. Yeah, and all the best.